or tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Monday morning, December the 29th, 1980. Midwinter camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Conference Grounds, Hot Springs, Arkansas. The Ellen Wood, the teacher of the morning, speaking on the Feast of Trumpets. This is tape three of three tapes in the series. All right, any, any questions this morning? All of them. All of them. No, you see, uh, in these four living creatures, remember the word is not beast, but it's soy, and in these four living creatures, you see the image and likeness of God brought forth. These are those that attain unto the highest in the image and likeness of God. This is the expression of them. Praise the Lord. We're in the Feast of Trumpets, though, this morning. Here. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, the Lord willing, uh, we want to talk to you about the man. And I think that um, this part of the message will, will um, may be very helpful to some of you. It will give you a release, I think. And then the second part of the message uh, will be on the lions. And the... Um, Tomorrow morning, the Lord willing, uh, have any of you heard any of these messages before anywhere? I don't very often give this, but tomorrow morning I want to teach you how to talk lion talk. We'll have a language class here in lion talk. Praise the Lord. How many of you like to talk lion talk? I think you'll never forget it. The few times that I've given this, um, they've never forgotten it. All right, so tomorrow morning we'll kind of have a double header. They're not both going to be long messages. I'll kind of shorten both of them. And uh, we'll have a lesson in, uh, in lang uh, a language lesson in lion talk. And uh, actually from the Bible. And uh, there are three words. There are four, but we'll focus on three. Uh, of the lion vocabulary. Praise the Lord. I think you'll find that interesting. I like to say that we need always to guard against uh, simply collecting Bible facts, understandings, and revelations. Everything that God brings to us in understanding must be translated into experience. Always remember that. I think I've told you about the lady, you know, that used to come to our church in North Hollywood. And uh, she's going on to be with the Lord now. But she always brought her notebook. And while I was talking, you know, what was that scripture, Brother Ellen Wood, you know, and I had to stop and give her the scripture. After a while, the notebook got full, and after a while, there was another notebook, and after a while, there was another notebook. And uh, one day I said to her, what are you going to do with all of these notes? Well, she didn't really know. She just had a lot of fun collecting notes. I'm not in the middle here, am I? I have to trim the ship up here. And uh, she moved away up into Canada, and later on, lo and behold, she wrote me a letter, and... She said, uh, Brother Hollywood, you preached one time on Psalm 119. I have a little thing I do on that. And, and uh, she said, could you send me the notes on it? There she was, still collecting notes. So we have to beware of uh, collecting notes. Now, it's good to put notes down. I don't uh, remember things too well unless I write them down. But there's a danger in just simply accumulating a lot of knowledge in the head. And anything that God brings unto our lives, eventually must be brought forth in relationship with the Lord and in experience. Praise the Lord. There's a real danger here. All right. Any uh, any other thought or question? Mm -hmm. I saw something when you were speaking on the four living creatures. You know, I read the book of Revelation and I'd always read over the top that those were redeemed people. I said that was just created beings and just mm -hmm. get over that. Yeah. So that's really... Uh, Showing a light on that for me, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, you will find some teachers that will try to leave out that word us. Thou hast redeemed us unto God. And uh, the word is found there twice. And uh, some of the top charismatic uh, leaders who do not uh, 
I feel understand some of the things concerning the Holy of Holies, want to leave that out. They don't want to accept the fact that these are people. And so they read it like this, thou hast redeemed unto God, you know, somebody else. But I've checked this out, and I think that all of the best manuscripts have the uh, pronoun in there, us. Thou hast redeemed us unto God. These are people. These are people. And then this is further verified by the fact that uh, they are in the throne, and uh, the only other picture that we have of this is that the overcomers are in the throne. They're brought to the throne. And uh, so we equate uh, these together. Praise the Lord. All right, just very briefly up here on the blackboard this morning, and uh, I just want to put the two tabernacles up here again. I think uh, that this is important. Remember that God is a spirit and is a spiritual realm, and there's an order in the spiritual realm. We do not understand these things, and so God has given us, as it's called in Hebrews in the Greek there, a corresponding impression. This is in Hebrews 10. He's given us a corresponding impression in the realm of the natural. And originally it was the Mosaic Tabernacle. And then there were subsequent temples. Altogether in the Word of God, there are about uh, uh, 11 temples and tabernacles and so on. Each one has its own story to tell. And so the Mosaic Tabernacle is this in the realm of the natural, and it was followed by the temples. This is the corresponding impression of this. You remember we've given you the example when we were teaching just on Tabernacle of the seal, the pressure of the seal upon the worn wax. You may never have seen the seal, but you know what the seal looks like because you see the corresponding impression in the wax. And so we don't see heavenly structuring just too much. One of these days, if we behave ourselves, we're going to. But we know what it's like because we see the corresponding impression. All right, just briefly, this is where the spirit-filled people live. This is their locale. This is the church. The fact is, both of these taken together are the full church. It takes the baptism of the Holy Ghost to bring us into the church. This is the part that is called the bride. And much of the New Testament is directed toward the development of the thought of this portion of the church or of the bride. And uh, then in the midst of this, God has is forming another fellowship. There is a church within a church right now. And at his coming, he will give them changed bodies. He will take them through this veil down here, not up into the heavenly structure yet, but into the realm of the Spirit down here, he will commission them, and he will bring them back into the holy place, and here they will purge the holy place. They will cleanse it. We have four pictures of the cleansing of the temple over in the Old Testament. And uh, you should study each one of these. We'll touch on one of them this morning, I think. But you should study these because... They tell us what these overcomers are going to do when God sends them back into the holy place. Each one of these four stories has something very special to tell you. Now, one thing that I'm getting a little bit more bold in saying, and I see it in the Word of God, that Satan's throne at the present time is in the holy place. Satan's throne is in here. Now, that's almost unbelievable. This is the place of the lampstands, isn't it? And he says to one of the lampstand churches, he says, I know where thou dwellest, where Satan's throne is. Now, in all of our concern, we need to be concerned about this, that we recognize where Satan is seeking to concentrate his power and authority. He is seeking to take over the spirit-baptized people. And in many cases, he's doing it. So we have the picture then that this is a defiled place. Jude sees Cain joining the church. Sometimes I put this on the blackboard as in smaller groups, but uh, you take the word Vatican. And spelling this out in the Hebrew, the B and the V are the same in Hebrew. You have B A T E C A N, which means the house of Cain. The house of Cain. So the house of Cain is seeking to penetrate this holy place. Cain has joined the church. Talks in tongues now. You have Balaam has joined the church. Balaam and his ass have come in. That's why there's so much litter around, you know. Korah has joined the church. What's Korah? 
for his rebellion, isn't it? These people say, well, we want all of these people to come in because if they're in here, we'll have a chance to minister to them. That's another delusion. Peter said on the day of Pentecost to separate yourselves from this untoward generation. Let only those come in who have been washed at the labor and redeemed by the blood. So Korah is in here. You say, well, I don't have any rebellion in me. Sometimes I make this statement that uh, I've, I think I've made it here. I could give you a little message that would stir up rebellion in 90% of you. Just real good rebellion. Real healthy rebellion in 90% of you. Then I always add to this, don't ask me what it is because I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> There's a timing in this, Glenn. And... Uh, but God's dealing with rebellion, isn't he, in many of us now? Praise the Lord. All right, then we find that Jezebel and her children have joined the church over in Revelation. She brought in all of her kids, her grandkids, actually. All these people are mixed in here among the Pentecostal people, the true uh, believers, spirit filled. They're all mixed in here. And so God is going to raise up a fan in his hand, and that's these overcomers. And in the cleansing of the church, you're going to see the biggest hurricane you've ever seen in your life. See, the temple was built upon a threshing floor, wasn't it? And um, Joel talks about the heap of wheat. He's talking about the threshing floor. And uh, there's a great big pile of wheat in there. It's been brought in from the fields and mixed in it, you know, uh, our bits of cow dung and dead, uh, dead frogs and lizards and leaves and stones and rocks and everything else. The pile of wheat hasn't been purified yet, but there's going to be a purifying of the church, and it's going to be one of the most uh, spectacular things you've ever seen in your life. And it's going to be affected by the overcomers. They're coming back to purge that church. All right, now, the reason I'm giving you this is that this is the Feast of Trumpets here. Now, trumpets are blown all through the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember the the last festival season called the uh, called Tabernacles consists of three uh, feasts of periods. The first is the Feast of Trumpets, and and the second is the Day of Atonement, and the third is Tabernacles proper. These three feasts make up the larger festival called Tabernacles. We've already had Passover, and in here we have Pentecost, but now we are at the doorway of trumpets. And I believe that the Feast of Trumpets begins with the first stage of the appearing of the Lord to the overcomers. And in this, they are brought into changed bodies. I've been hoping for quite a while that that would happen. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many of you feel that way? Praise the Lord. Does anybody remember what uh, a trumpet is in the Bible symbology? All right, say it out loud. Well, that's uh, in the Hebrew, Hasserah. What, uh, what, what is the meaning of a, of a trumpet? Uh, well, let's, uh, I gave you another definition here. Sir. You remember the word authoritative voice? All right. A trumpet is an authoritative voice. I think maybe we ought to say that together a couple of times. Uh, let's see. Uh, a trumpet is an authoritative voice. All right. Let's say it about three times here. A trumpet is an authoritative voice. A trumpet is an authoritative voice. A trumpet is an authoritative voice. That's the way they teach in Chinese schools, isn't it? Something like that. By repeating it, you know, it, it registers. All right, so at the coming of the Lord, we have the authoritative voice. We have the trump of God, or the last trump. And in Revelation 1, we have the Lord coming with the uh, voice as of a trumpet. And all the words that he speaks uh, from uh, chapter 1, I think it's about verse 10 or 11, on through to chapter 4, verse 1, is the sound of the last trump. So the Feast of Trumpets is down here. And my feeling is that it is imminent. Now, I can spell that right. The older I get, the worse I spell. Now, I want to say this. You say, well, Brother Owen, well, this means then that when the Lord comes, he's coming at the Feast of Trumpets. Now, I would like to tell you positively that this is so. Jesus died on the Passover day, you remember? Pentecost came on the day of Pentecost. And I would like to say, well, you don't have to worry about any other month of the year. Just wait until 
Now, the Feast of Tabernacles comes and uh, get the date on the calendar and get everything all straightened up, rush around and, and get the gas bill paid and everything and, and your telephone bill and, and if you have, uh, you know, if you've been on the out for somebody, get it all straightened up. I can't tell you that because we may not know all of the factors. All I can tell you is that the first phase of his appearing may be on the day uh, of the opening of the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, but the Bible says to watch, not just on that particular day, but to watch all the time. There may be factors here we don't understand. There may be other phases of the coming of the Lord that we don't understand. For example, when the captain of the host appeared unto Joshua, it was at the Passover time. And you remember that uh, three men appeared unto uh, Abraham, and uh, it was in the heat of summer. It was a very hot day. And so it must have been in the summertime. And so we have some pictures of the coming of the Lord, and they're not all found at the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. See, Jesus said, in such an hour as you think not. So if you say, well, I think not that the Lord can come in January or February, that may be the time he's going to come. Now, I hope I've made this clear to you. All right, so but we see here that the Feast of Trumpets is connected with the appearing of the Lord. This is down here. All right. This cleansing of the church may occupy a period of, uh, you know, this is all conjecture. I have this in those notes, the seven stars. It's pure conjecture. Might be eight or nine years. And remember this time that the living in Christ are going to be joined unto the dead in Christ. And the whole body of Christ will be on the earth for a period probably of several years the purpose of which is to purify the body of Christ's church. Hallelujah. Now, you ponder on that. Peter's going to be here, huh? Yes. All right. I haven't gone into that. You got some of that. Yes. 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 Uh, was it seven days? Oh, seven months. Okay. I haven't been in that book for a while. But uh, uh, they will ministers, the whole body of Christ will be here. Because at the coming of the Lord, the dead anointed ones are going to be brought forth too. Now, how many other saints? I don't know. Maybe Old Testament saints? I don't know. But I say at least the anointed ones from the day of Pentecost on down are going to be joined together in the earth for a period of ministry that may last for several years. And this period of ministry will be focused toward the body of Christ's church to cleanse it, and to bring it into divine order. This means to cast out the sectarianism so that all of the spirit-filled people can flow together as one. This may last for several years. At the end of this period, then we have the door opened in the heavenly structuring. This is very obvious. In the book of Revelation, we come up into the heavenly realm. The book of Revelation, most of it, is on two stages. The first stage, is the earthly tabernacle, chapters 1, 2, and 3. The second stage is the heavenly tabernacle, chapters 4, and on down um, probably through 17, on the heavenly stage. It's a drama. It's a play. And so in chapter 4, we have the ascension of these overcomers up into the heavenly tabernacle. And from this point, God then sends them back and here we see the picture of the seven stars, the seven angels. And he sends them back with the seven trumpet judgments. You see, trumpets are still sounded all the way through. And then he sends them back with a bold judgment. And this is a period of time which we believe will last for seven years. The cleansing of the outer court. We call this the tribulation period. The last half of which is, is the tribulation, the great tribulation, as it is in the Greek. Probably the trumpet judgments are are brought forth in the first half of the seven-year period and the bold judgments, which are the judgments of the unmitigated wrath of God, will be poured out upon the kingdom of the Antichrist. In the middle of this period, the kingdom of Antichrist falls. It receives its death blow. And in the next few years, in the last half of that seven-year period, it's a mop-up uh, operation. It's just, uh, you know, just cleaning up the mess. This is a picture over in, in Matthew 13. 
where he sends his angels. These angels are not spirit angels, they're people angels. He sends his people angels, and they separate the wheat from the tares. This is where the wheat and the tares are separated, out here. And he's going to remove out of the kingdom all things that have been. You're going to have the privilege, beloved, of destroying the things that belong to the kingdom of Satan. You're doing it now. Remember we told you that all the feasts and everything reflect backward and forward. And so right now, you're entering into that. You're burning up the record. There was a, uh, you, you folks know the sister up from uh, Los Alamos and uh, New Mexico. And uh, what she told me that when the Lord was moving up there, that the young people brought, uh, you know, just piles of records and so on, and they had a burning of the records up there in public. I think they did this on two different occasions. And, and you're going through your house, and you're cleaning out the things that uh, that belong to the kingdom of Babylon. And uh, But this is going to be done now, not in part, but in fullness. Everything that's going on now is in part. But in that day, everything will be done in fullness. You're going to have the privilege of going in. And, you know, one time I, I uh, bought a plant nursery, and there was a lot of old buildings on it that I wanted to get rid of. And so I hired uh, some men to... Uh, come and clean it up and one great big old burly guy he said you got a wrecking bar he says I just love to wreck things <laughs> and I've often thought about that I just love to wreck things too and God's going to give his people a big wrecking bar and they're going to wreck uh, the pornographic printing presses and, and they're going to wreck uh, the, the, the uh, you know you know on down the line here the adult theaters then they're going to go over to Africa where the witch doctors go and learn to learn their trade. And they're going to wreck those places. They're going to take out of the kingdom all things that offend and all people that offend God. They're going to remove them out. Everything. What's that? Yes, everything. And there's going to be a cleansing of the kingdom. Praise the Lord. So here we have the Feast of Trumpets beginning down here. And the opening up here of the Holy of Holies this ascension I call the Day of Atonement because John who represents and heads the overcomers is brought up in Revelation 4.1 and he's brought up into the heavenly Holy of Holies and up here then is the Day of Atonement and then after the Day of Atonement there will be the cleansing of the kingdom and the bringing of the kingdom into the Feast of Tabernacles. I just wanted to give this to you to, to uh, show you the relationship between the two tabernacles and the feast. The way that I understand it is that before the seven-year period, God's going to have a company of people in changed bodies. During the seven-year period, he will preserve the church. It will be upon the earth, the holy place people. They'll have to go through that seven-year period, but they will be preserved. This man-child will preserve this woman. At one point, you remember, she was given the wings of an eagle. Eagle saints are up here. This means that these eagle saints are going to come down and help her through something. And she's going to be given the wings of the eagle. It's another way of saying that the man-child is going to help this woman down here through a crisis. We don't understand exactly what that crisis will be. And then God has the third group of people, and they're going to have to suffer the tribulation, I believe, just like sinners do. And these are the ones that will have to face the mark of the beast. And if they refuse to take it, will be martyred. And so out of the great tribulation are coming a great multitude of people. Generally speaking, God's people seem to fall into three great groups. Number one, a company of people, I believe, will be changed before the storm breaks. Number two, there will be a company of people that will be preserved during the storm as Noah was preserved. And then number three, there will be those believers, perhaps, who come uh, into faith during the tribulation time, and uh, God's not, not going to make, I think, much difference between them and the sinners, and they're going to have to suffer the things of this great tribulation. These are awesome things. And this is why we need to get ready to go through this third veil. This is our refuge. If you're planning on staying in the earth during the tribulation period, Perhaps you'd better store up food for seven years. Now, I'm not against storing up food. Um, when God gives a bountiful harvest, I think we should preserve it, and he may be giving it for, you know, a period of a couple of years to sustain us. But these that go through the veil won't need that. 
They won't need it because, remember our message on Seth here, this is the hiding place. Psalms 27, Psalms 32, Psalms 91. These come up into the secret place of the Most High. In Psalm 91, you remember we showed you, it says that uh, they will sit down under the shadow of the Almighty and they will have lodging for the night. They'll have lodging for the night. And so God will, will help them and sustain them. Praise the Lord. So here's trumpet. Here's the Day of Atonement. And down here is the preparation for the Feast of Tabernacles. All right. Just about two minutes for questions because I don't want to get too involved in this. Any questions now or comments? I don't know. Uh, like I say, uh, uh, I've heard nearly all the thinking along this line. You know, I'm in contact with people who see some of these areas of understanding. And, and I've never heard an explanation yet that really satisfies me. Um, I usually will tell people this little thing. Some of you know Brother Ed Miller from uh, Argentina. And um, so uh, they had a visitation down there quite a few years ago. I don't know if you have his book on that or not, but there's quite a visitation down there. One of the things that happened, that the angel of the Lord appeared, and there was one young man by the name of Alexander, and the angel would appear at the side of Alexander and uh, would speak into his ear. And uh, Alexander then would give it forth as prophecy. And uh, one of the things that the angel said down there was that the time was coming when God was going to send two witnesses to all of the great cities of the earth. So I don't know if this relates or not, but um, this is what the Lord spoke to them down there. And uh, then the angel began to name many of the cities, and when the angel named them, he didn't name them in Spanish. You know, that's what they talk down there. But he named these cities in the language of the country. And uh, there are a number of different nationalities represented in the school there. And uh, Alexander gave the names of these countries accurately, or the names of these cities accurately. And uh, he didn't know these languages, of course. And so I often have that in mind. Somewhere along the line, uh, God is going to bring forth his witness. In Revelation 14, we find that uh, some of these uh, sons of God are going to go through the air and they're going to proclaim the everlasting gospel. The worldwide preaching of the gospel takes place in Revelation 14. The uh, coming of the Lord takes place in Revelation 1, the first stage of it. And uh, uh, the gospel does not have to be preached at this point to every nation. There is nothing that has to be fulfilled, as far as I know, uh, before the coming of the Lord. There are no bells that he rings as warning. And all of these things that people interpose as prerequisites for the coming of the Lord uh, can be shown uh, not to be valid. Hmm? Hmm? Yes, they die. Yeah. For this reason, some of them think that as Enoch and... And uh, Elijah, who didn't go through the veil by the way of death, but that's only conjecture, they uh, seem to do the works of Elijah, withholding rain and so on. But at this point, as far as I'm concerned, I do not know who they are positively. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been taught that um, the book of Revelation is chronological. No, the, um, I broke the book of Revelation up, if you have those seven stars, and uh, just, just very briefly. And by and large, the events of the book of Revelation, I believe, are chronological. And uh, chapter 1, you have the appearing of the Lord, chapters 2 and 3, the, the, the cleansing of the church, 4-1, uh, the, the ascension of, um, of the overcomers into the throne of God. And uh, then you have seven seals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are the seals that have to do with the opening of the um, title deed to the earth. And then you have seven uh, trumpets, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then you have seven uh, bowls, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, here and there in the drama, there is an inset which will give you an understanding either backward or forward. But the most of the book of Revelation, I believe, is, is a drama, it's a story. And um, some people try to make the seven bowls to be the same as the seven trumpets, and the seven trumpets to be the same as the seven seals, and I feel that that's a very bad interpretation of Scripture. You really don't have a, any law of interpretation for this. And uh, 
by and large, I see the book of Revelation as being, uh, the events being consecutive. All right. One more question, we'll move on. No. In the, in the first place, you'll notice that uh, these are the trumpets of uh, the overcomers. These seven angels are another picture of the overcomers. Remember, uh, we taught you that, that angels in the book of Revelation are people. People angels. And uh, this is not the trump of God. This is the trump of the overcomers. The last trump of, that God has ever sounded or will have ever sounded is in Revelation 1. The first time that God ever sounded a trumpet was on Mount Sinai. And the second and last time that God will ever have uh, made a trumpet sound, you know, as far as our revelation goes, is in Revelation 1. When John hears, he, John is projected down into the day of the Lord, and uh, uh, the words of the Lord there are the last trump. And uh, we showed you in a, in a red letter Bible. Uh, you have a red letter Bible. Red letter Bible doesn't mean any, anything to me as such because everything in the Word of God is really red letter. But uh, these direct quotations, we'll say, begin in Revelation 1.11. In my Bible, they're in red here. And I use this Bible because it has big print. And so um, everything in, in red here, in chapter 1, in chapter 2, and in chapter 3, uh, is the last trump. You want to know what the last trump's going to sound like? It's, it's there. And uh, it ends in 4. And... Um, the words come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter, should also be in red. They're not in my Bible, but they should be in red. Because the same trumpet, the same voice speaking, it's a part of the last trump. The, uh, a lot of confusion has come, I believe, in the understanding of the book of Revelation by confusing the seven trumpets of the overcomers with the two trumpets that God flows. I, uh, myself, I reject this, this uh, teaching completely. The last trump is sounded in Revelation 1, 2, 3, and 4, 4, 1. Okay? All right. Now, just a few more things this morning about the trumpets. I think we better uh, put our trumpet sound up here. Octo Serah. I kind of like that. Okay. Octo Serah. I, I was thinking, you know, when Glenn was saying that he didn't have any musical voice, well, the thing that interests the Lord uh, more is the is the sound of the trumpet, and the sound of the trumpet is what an authoritative voice. Hallelujah! So we we got that left yet. Praise the Lord. Maybe someday we'll be able to sing it too, because uh, you know the word Hallelujah is sung in the Word of God. But uh, the main thing is this authoritative voice. All right, now all of the soundings of trumpets in the Word of God are pictures of what's going to happen at the coming of the Lord when the trumpets are blown in the Feast of Trumpets. They all point forward to that period of time. We're going to just talk here in a general sense uh, because even the, uh, the uh, trumpets of the seven stars of the overcomers are included in this trumpeting in this period of time. Remember we told you the trumpets were blown at all the feasts. I think they had a big time when they came together. Uh, there didn't seem to be um, necessarily in the beginning uh, just in order for the blowing of trumpets. For example, on the day of trumpets, it just seemed they all got trumpets and just blew as a memorial before the Lord. Uh, I kind of like that. Today we're getting so sophisticated in our worship, it's painful. Remember, we taught you that worship is in spirit and in truth. And one of the elements of worship is spontaneity. And I go to places where the worship is all planned, all planned ahead of time. And uh, uh, when you... Uh, Sing why uh, the singing is all planned, and if the song leader kicks his foot just right, then we all dance, and everything is just kind of uh, uh, formalized for us. But I think the worship in those days was much more spontaneous, especially in the beginning. And um, so they just got the trumpets out and went, hot so so raw, hot so so raw. And then one priest, you know, he'd get impatient, he'd say, hey, You've been doing it too long. Let me have it, you know. And he'd pull it out, and he would go. And I don't know how many trumpeters they had there in the beginning, but uh, they had these two silver trumpets that were special for the purpose. Later on, they had more trumpets. All right, so, see what I want to give you here. Now, last time, we found out that the trumpets were blown 
One blast was for the gathering of the princes. And when the Lord comes in the initial stage of his coming, that first blast is for the princes, the overcomers. They're the ones that come up into the heavenly holy of holies. That first blast calls them together. Later on, uh, there's a blast for the whole camp. And then there was the sounding of trumpets for the moving of the camp. Now remember that already these things are reflecting back this way. And I believe that some of us are hearing right now a trumpet sound to get moving. I believe this. We have been in philosophy and, and theory, and uh, we've got a lot in our notes that now we need to get into our experience. Amen. Hallelujah. So it's for the moving of the camp. They sing a song in some places, the church of God is moving. Well, there's a portion of the church of God that's moving. That church was in the church. Then the trumpets were sounded to, to give an alarm. And uh, even this first trumpet is an alarm for all of the nations of the earth. They, they probably don't hear it. I think that only the overcomers who are tuned in on station, H-O-L-Y, S-P-I-R-I-T, are going to hear the sound of the trumpet. You know our message along that way. All right, so uh, there's an alarm. And uh, I think the earth has, has a right to be alarmed. And even the body of Christ's church uh, that has not been ready for the coming of the Lord, it has a right to be alarmed. There's an alarm coming. Many scriptures in the prophets along that line about sounding the alarm. Then the trumpets were blown uh, for the marching of the people, and uh, we had this last time, and, and then in warfare, and then they, they were blown in the victory. Praise the Lord. We talked about the fall of Jericho. Je the fall of Jericho is the great type in the Old Testament of the fall of Babylon. It was the key city. All right, now this morning, just a few more thoughts here. All right, let's turn over to Nehemiah, the eighth chapter. Now, we're not told here that trumpets were blown, but apparently... The event in Nehemiah, the 8th chapter, took place at the time of the Feast of Trumpets, because right after this, it says in uh, chapter 8, Nehemiah chapter 8, uh, verse 18, the last verse, that they kept the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the feast mentioned here, according to the manner. And so apparently the events in chapter 8 took place during the Feast of Trumpets. All right, verse 1, all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded in Israel. Now, in my understanding, this can apply to that time after the coming of the Lord, that the body of Christ's church that wasn't ready for the coming of the Lord will seek the ministry of these that have come into changed bodies. In that day, they're going to want to know about the book of the law, not just of Moses here. The, uh, we're told that Samuel, who was the last of the Shophetim, laid up the book of the kingdom before the Lord. To lay up something before the Lord is to bring it at least into the holy place and probably into the holy of holies. The book of the kingdom is in the presence of the Lord. And these overcomers in going through the veil and coming back will have the knowledge of the kingdom of God. And that body of Christ's church is going to seek for the understanding. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. That's trumpets, isn't it? And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate. This is the Bible water gate thing in it. From the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Now, the ears of the people are not attentive. There is much truth going forth and much understanding, but the cry was, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. But they're not tuned in on station, H-O-L-Y-S-P-I-R-I-T. And they're introducing all kinds of things into the pulpit, metaphysical teaching, all of this into the pulpit. But in that day, they're going to want to know, Lord, what is your word? What, is your, what do you have for us? And so on. So Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. Now, in the Feast of Trumpets, 
the word of the Lord is going to be exalted. It's going to be exalted. It isn't exalted today in many of our uh, full gospel Pentecostal churches because the context of all of our teaching nearly is this holy place, the area of spirit-filled people, whatever you call yourself, charismatic, Pentecostal, full gospel, whatever. Now, I, I appreciate books and tapes, and I believe that God uses them, but I want to tell you something. They are not enough. They are not enough. I believe God uses them. And I know many people have come to me and told me that somewhere a tape came across their pathway and it stirred their interest and they sought out a, a full gospel group and God filled them with the Holy Ghost and so on. So I know they serve a purpose. That there's a danger in living on books and tapes. Uh, I sometimes uh, use this word eclectic. Does anybody here know what eclectic means? What does it mean? Yeah. Did you hear this before? You just knew that? Oh, well, I'm, I'm very You're very eclectic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. See, most Pentecostal people are eclectic. You know, I really appreciate that. You're the first person that ever knew what the word meant. And uh, the only reason I use the word is not that I'm trying to appear smart, but it's the only word that expresses the thing. A lot of people have, for example, Christian science is an eclectic religion. It gets a little bit from here and a little bit from there and a little bit from the philosophy and, and puts it together and makes a religion. Many of God's people today have an eclectic understanding of the word of God. They got one of Bob Mumford's tapes, they got one of Derek Prince's books, and, and uh, they get some of Lee Ellen Wood's things, you know, and they put it all together, and I don't know what they get when they get through. They simply have an eclectic understanding of the Word of God and an eclectic relationship with the Lord. But in that day, the Word of the Lord, the pure Word of the Lord, is going to be exalted. Hallelujah. On the Feast of Trumpets. So then Ezra stands there, and he's got six men on one side and seven men on the other, makes 14 altogether. And uh, the Word of God says in, in the verse 3, and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate and so on from the morning until midnight. Now, how are we going to be able to minister like that? Because we're going to have to have some changed bodies. I'm sure of that. You know, yeah, sometimes when you minister for two or three or four hours, you, you kind of bush. At least at my age you get that way, you know. But in that day, uh, there's going to be a continuous ministry of these that come into sunship. I sometimes put it like this, and when it gets dark here, well, I, the Lord just move us over to Japan or somewhere where it's getting light, and, and uh, we can just go on over there and just move us around. Uh, we won't need any nap times in between. Well, glory. How many of you take naps? It says, before the men and the women that could understand, and all of the ears of the people were attentive. God now is going to have their attention because they missed the coming of the Lord that God is sending back some people in, in changed bodies that will have perfect understanding and perfect perception of perfected ministry. So they stood on this pulpit of wood. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, for he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. This is talking now about a day to come. And that time is coming when the word of the Lord, when it comes forth, now, people are going to stand before that word in reverence. Hallelujah. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people said, Amen, Amen. Have you ever studied the word Amen? Get into it in the Hebrew sometimes. It, it has to do with a covenant. And when you say Amen, Amen, you are telling God that you are in accord with his covenant. And you want to move in his covenant. Now the people are coming into covenant relationship. They have been, uh, uh, as we have it in Revelation 2 and 3, they have left their first love and, and uh, they've been defiled and they're spotted and all of these things described in Revelation 2 and 3 and in, and in Jude and in uh, Malachi uh, chapters 1 and 2. But now they're coming back into covenant relationship in this new ministry that God will bring forth in that day. Hallelujah. And they're going to say, Amen, Amen. And with the lifting up of their heads, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. In verse 8, so they read in the book, in the law of the Lord distinctly. Hallelujah. The, the Bible says that 
His word is going to come out of time, out of the Holy of Holies. And we're not going to have a lot of people around to, to argue. You know, actually, right now, we, we don't understand everything perfectly. And so sometimes we ask questions. I'm not talking about that. But in that way, there's going to be a perfect understanding brought forth by these sons of God. And so they're going to have understanding. And he calls the as it says, so they read in the book of the Lord distinctly and gave the sense or the meaning and caused them to understand the reading. This has to do with the Feast of Trumpets. And then he says uh, in verse 9, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. And he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hallelujah. This is a man child ministering unto the woman in the wilderness. And it says that they feed her. Another picture of that same thing. This is part of the Feast of Trumpets now coming up. Praise the Lord. All right, let's turn over to First Chronicles 16. Hallelujah. I get into these things, I get so excited. You know, the other night, I, I couldn't go to sleep. I tell people sometimes I enjoy my own messages. That sounds egotistical. <laughs> but it isn't. I figure if I don't enjoy them, nobody else is going to enjoy them, you know. But uh, when God brings these things to me, I get real joyful. And uh, uh, I know that when people hear some of these things for the first time, they get real joyful too, you know. And the other night I got so... You know, kind of, what's the word they use now? Hyped up over this, you know? I couldn't go to sleep for a long time. Praise the Lord. All right, let's see. First Chronicles 16. Now, in verse 1, First Chronicles 16, 1. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had fixed for it. And they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings and before the Lord. And when David had made an end of offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the Lord people in the name of the Lord. And he dealt to every one of Israel, both men and man and woman, and to everyone a loaf of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. And then he says, He appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to bring uh, and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. Asaph the chief, and we won't read all of these names, but down there it says that, uh, that Asaph made a sound with cymbals. And Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests, with trumpets continually before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. All right, in the feast of trumpets, there is going to be an authoritative voice in praise. Worship is going to go on before the Lord continuously. Actually, these four living creatures and the four and twenty elders and never seem to leave the throne area, uh, but they are the leaders in the worship before God, even while uh, the great tribulation itself is going on uh, down in the earth below. And so the trumpet is connected with worship. Praise the Lord. All right, let me give you one another scripture too. This time let's turn over to Second Kings, the eleventh chapter. Now this is a picture. These were the days when Satan was seeking to take over Jerusalem and make it its capital. There is this thing in Satan, he is wanting to get back to the place from which he has fallen. At one time, he was one of those in the very presence of God. And he's always seeking to get back. He's not content just to dominate the world out here, the outer court and beyond. He wants to get back into the holy place because the holy place is next to the holy of holies. He still has it in his mind that he's going to be thrown down. You don't believe it? Read Psalm the, the second Psalm. Let us break their bands of thunder. And so he works in individuals. First of all, he begins to get a, a committed group of people together that he is strengthened and he can go still further. So the picture is is a Satan trying to take over Jerusalem, the place of Zion, the place of Moriah, the place of the palace, the place of the temple. But he didn't come in directly. 
Remember, the kingdom in those days was divided in, in two. And uh, there was the northern kingdom, uh, consisting of, of around nine to ten tribes, however you want to divide it. And then there was the southern kingdom, consisting largely of Judah and uh, Benjamin. So he didn't come directly to the southern kingdom, he came to the northern kingdom. And uh, he, he made an arrangement. Uh, the, uh, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, married a pagan princess by the name of Jezebel. Now see, this is his strategy. And so Jezebel had a daughter. And uh, Satan got Jezebel then, Jezebel's daughter, Ethaliah, married to the king of the southern kingdom. He was working his way in. You not only uh, uh, need not to what only what Satan is doing, but the direction in which he's heading. So he wants that city down there. So he comes to Israel, and then the daughter of the king and queen of Israel becomes the wife of the king of Judah. Now this is quite a long and complicated story here. And uh, we're not going to go into the, all of the details of it. So something happens and all of the king's seed are killed. All of the uh, legitimate heirs to the throne are killed. And so Athaliah takes the throne. When, a when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that his son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. This is one of those tense moments in divine history. Some of you have studied the messianic line and so on. And uh, you have been had teaching on how Satan attacked this line. Sometimes apparently it almost destroyed it. And this is one of these places. And there was only one legitimate heir to the throne of David. And that was a little baby by the name of Joel. And she didn't even seem to know about him. But Jesheba, the daughter of King Joram, the sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain. When this massacre was going on, she crept in there, and she shot the little baby. It was one of the most critical places in, in Scripture. And so they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. And he was with her, hid in the house of the Lord, six years. He Leaked him into a bedchamber, and from there they took him over to the temple. And he was hidden in the temple, and he was there for six years. While Athaliah, the daughter of Jezebel, was ruling in Israel. This is a picture of that man called. You see, while all of, uh, of this evil is going on in the body of Christ's church, God is forming this church within the church. He's forming this company of overcoming. And they are right under the noses of Cain and Jezebel and Korah and all these people. Right under their noses, but they don't see him. Isn't that beautiful? Don't get anxious to have a convention on this thing God is doing. You know, a great big convention. You know, little ones like this are all right. God has hidden this church. Don't get out and expose all of these things to a lot of carnal Pentecostal people. Some of you have had experience and, and uh, you weren't your seed. You know what was happening? Well, God deliberately was hiding this thing from these that you were trying to bring into it. Now notice that Joash had a news. Now there are many aspects of the things that God is doing. And uh, we preach sometimes about the bringing forth of the man-child and how he's a full-grown man when he comes forth, able to function in all of the things of the kingdom. But, and uh, we compare this to Adam when he was brought forth. He didn't have to be taught to do things. He was already programmed. He functioned as a full-grown man. But there's another aspect of this, too. This man-child company also begins as an infant. And it has to be married. That's all they need. There are hundreds of people, and I believe thousands of people throughout the land, to whom the Holy Spirit is intimating these truths, but they don't understand them. God is apprehending Joash in this hour. 
and uh, maybe part of my ministry is that of being a nurse. And uh, some of these people are, are hidden. God has been talking to them, and they don't understand just what it was all about. And I imagine from time to time the old priest of Hoya that came in and explained to Joash who he was, the seed royal, the one that was going to take the throne, the nurse there was to take care of him. Maybe she taught him some little Bible story books to begin with, you know, like we do children sometimes, and as he was able to understand why some of the more poignant truths were given to him. But he had to be married. And I, you know, just from my own point of view, I'm so pleased. So I go back to places uh, once a year, half a year, something like that, a year and a half. And it's, it's really a joy when you come back next time to see that little Joe has to grown a little bit. <laughs> Hallelujah. I think I've seen that here, Glenn, with your group here. And every year, I see a growth. Okay. But you're still hidden. And you want to expose all of these things to people. You want to go down the street and say, Hey, I'm one of the sons of God. You know, people do these silly things. Don't you try to manifest yourself. You let God bring forth this manifestation. Hallelujah. And so, here is Jehoiada, the priest. Now, this story is important because remember that in the Holy of Holies, we have the high priesthood and the high kingship. And so here we have the, the, the king and the priest working together. See, in Israel, God severed the kingship and the priesthood, and he had to use two different men to express the thing. Uh, for example, in the book of Zechariah, uh, you have Joshua the high priest and you have the rubber bell the prince. In our day, he brings the two together, and they're one. In that day, there was a left side to the throne, and you've heard me talk about this, and the right side to the throne. But in our day, uh, the two sides were brought together, and they become one. The book of Hebrews is on the left side of the throne, and the book of Revelation is on the right side of the throne. Uh, but the time is coming when they are the kingship. But here it's divided in order to teach us some of the truths of God. And so here's this little king hidden for six years. That old Jezebel dominated. I've had people come to me, one, one man in particular has written a book exposing all of the things that are wrong in the holy place among any class of people. And I saw a copy of this book. I think I talked to Glenn about this. And he sent a copy, uh, you know, not, not, a, not a, a printed book, but... Uh, a, uh, what do you call it? A mock-up or something? Yeah, and I had a time to a friend of mine. And I looked through it. I said, tell the brother. I said, don't sing it. The time hasn't come yet. There's coming this tremendous cleansing to the body of Christ's faith. But it's not for just now. Don't print it. No. It's not the time for the manifestation of this company of people that goes through the veil. There's an appointed time for them to go through, and there's an appointed time for them to come back. I don't know how long they're going to be behind, be behind the veil. Uh, actually, I don't think very long. And so, this thing is hidden now. This is hidden. But now the priest feels it's time to bring the king to the throne, even though he's only six years old. And so he devises a strategy. And uh, we're not going to have time to go into all of this. But down in verse 10 it says, And to the captains over hundreds, that is the faithful ones now, did the priest give King David's spears and shields that were in the temple of the Lord. See, there's going to be a warfare here. There's going to be a, a, a conflict, and the weapons must come from before the Lord. We, we get, uh, you know, all excited about the warfare, and so we begin to fight in the flesh. It's not going to be accepted that way. Now, I wasn't against faith. March on Washington. I think it's time that some of God's people spoke up and, and said, we're not going to let the devil take over the country and things like that. But I know in my own heart that that march in Washington wasn't going to overturn the strong man over the United States. The weapons that will bind the strong man must come from the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. These are David's weapons. Here, David is a type of Jesus. See, David has won the victory. And he's got the weapons laid up for those that are to bring forth his victory and apply his victory wherever it is needed. Our, our 
Reference must come from the presence of the Lord. We have another picture of this from David himself. Remember when he came before the priest, and when he had the holy bread and so on? And uh, he wanted the, uh, a weapon, and, and the priest said, well, there's only one weapon, and that was the one with which he killed the lion. Then he said, that's a good weapon. It was wrapped up in an ephod, and the priest was on it. And so the high priest went and gave David uh, the weapon uh, with which he had killed the lion. Now, there is only one weapon in one sense of the word that's going to be effective, and it is the weapon by which Jesus Christ has the seed of the devil. Hallelujah. And in the feast of trumpets, that God is going to have a company of people and to whom he's going to give the victory of Jesus, and they're going to go forth, and they're going as to apply the victory. Hallelujah. And bring down the powers of darkness. Glory to God. Signing petitions and all of these things. You know, don't have to do them. I say do whatever we can, but don't count on the bind the sun. Hallelujah. I don't want to discourage anybody. It wants to do something for God. And so they came out and they brought forth the king's son. And they put the crown on him. And they gave him the testimony. And they made him king. And anointed him. Remember, only two people are anointed in the Bible. One is the king, and one is the priest. God never anoints programs. <laughs> you know, there's so much of that in these days, you know. But he gets a, gets a program. And uh, uh, I think it'd be interesting to make a collection of all of these, you know, save your junk mail. And what I can do, you know, if you will send me a hundred dollars, you know, if a hundred of you will send me a hundred dollars, or a thousand of you, I can do this and I can do that. God doesn't anoint a program. God anoints people. Hallelujah. 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 Let's linger in the presence of God and come under that anointing. Praise the Lord. And so they anointed him. And they began to clap their hands. Come on, let's clap our hands, huh? Hallelujah. And they began to shout, God save the king. God save the king. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And so, here's this Jezebel's daughter here, Ephaliah. And she heard the noise of the guard and of the people, and she came to the people, uh, into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar, right under her nose. He, right under her nose stood the one that was going to overthrow her, as his manner was. And the princes and the trumpeters, the people with the authoritative voices, see, this is pointing forward again to the era into which we are now entering. And God's going to have his trumpeters there. They stood by the king, and all the people of the land rejoiced, and they blew with trumpets, and Athaliah rent her clothes, and she cried, Treason! Treason! <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. She, hollering out, Treason. When she was the one that had committed treason in Israel. Hallelujah. Do you know what these demons are, are screaming when they come out of people? I want to give you a little secret. They're, they're saying, treason, treason. They thought that you uh, had accepted them and would serve them and rule them. And God came along by his word and by his power and has exposed them. And now they're crying, treason, treason to you. When they come out, and the trumpeters are there. I'm going to stop. Yeah, that's enough. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Save it till tomorrow morning. That'll be a little longer, maybe. I just feel good right now. Just a moment, Raymond. Hallelujah. I just feel good right now. Praise the Lord. I tell you what, I like to have us do. You know, um, I, I know that none of us like to play the bad guy, but um, we're, we're about to my. My priests here, the, the uh, hot so raw people. Huh? Some of you come up here, seven or eight hot so raw people. Just stand across the front here, all right? And uh, this side over here is going to be uh, God save the king people. And this side over here is going to be uh, Athaliah. And, and you're going to shout, treason, treason. <laughs> no. Uh, we'll change it around. And I want the trumpeters to blow up here, you know, with an authoritative voice. Uh, so, sirrah, you know, shout it with an authoritative voice. 
And I, I you know, I've never done this before. I, I, I want to tell you that many of the things we do are just completely unrehearsed. But I figure, well, there's nobody here but us. Hallelujah. Nobody here but us, so, so what, you know? So if it doesn't work out, you know, like our special number up here, we need a little practice next time you come. Let's practice ahead of time here. So uh, let's all stand here, and uh, let's, let's just, uh, this side over here begins shouting, God save the king. And this side uh, shout, treason, treason, and, and you trumpeters up here, you know, you can uh, say, hot so sirrah. Or uh, if you've been in some of our other meetings, you know what Yasha means, uh, you know, something like that, hallelujah. And let's just see what happens here. I know it's going to be kind of noisy. I don't know how it's going to sound on the on the tape. Okay, let's go. Over here now. On both sides over here. All right, God. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's, let's change now. Let's change uh, and uh, you, you can be the bad people, and you be the good people, and the trumpeters can still be the trumpeters, huh? Okay, let's do it again now. Amen. God save the king. Treason. God save the king. Treason. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. All right, let's all join together in this one song here. Praise the Lord. Let's all just join together on it. He's the King of Kings, He's the Lord of Lords, His name is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. of the trumpets here, but get your Bibles out and look up trumpets wherever it's found, and in almost every case, it will point forward to what is going to happen in the end time, all of these events, and the bringing forth of Jesus as the King of Kings is one of the things that will happen in the next few years. Uh, he's already the King of Kings, you know, by appointment, but he's going to be received by the earth. We're going to bring him into his place, and uh, these people are going to bring him out of hiding, and... Uh, uh, Sometimes people say, well, you believe in the manifestation of the sons of God. And um, I had kind of a trite answer. And I said, well, I'm more interested in the manifestation of the Son of God. Hallelujah. And so that's what's happening. He's going to come forth. And down there in Revelation 11, chapters proclaim that now are the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and so on. And then another thing to look up in connection with the Feast of Trumpets. Look up the seventh month in your commentary. And list all the scriptures that have to do with the seventh month. And uh, many of these involve the Feast of Trumpets. This is the next thing, I believe, in the program of God. The coming of the Lord will usher in the Feast of Trumpets. Praise the Lord. All right. You have one here? What, what was that? Okay. How many of you know that? I think we taught that here before. Will you lead us in this? Well, remember we learned on the job here? <laughs> Okay, praise the Lord. Does anybody know this song? Does anybody know this song? Come on forward, please. I hear the sound of God's great army. I hear the sound of marching. I hear the sound of God's great army, it shall never know thee. I hear the sound of God's great army, I hear the sound of marching thee. 
I hear the sound of God's great army. It shall never know decay. I hear the sound of God's great army. I hear the sound of marching feet. I hear the sound of God's great army. It shall never know the sound of God's great army. I hear the sound of marching speed. I hear the sound of God's great army. It shall never know defeat. Amen. Okay, hallelujah. All together, once more, maybe three times, God save the king. And then like the people did, we can all clap our hands. Praise the Lord. I think we ought to get back into these Bible situations again. Praise the Lord. All right. God save the king. God save the king. God save the king. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. This is the end of this message. Our website is www. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp dot com and LHBC online dot com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.